Welcome to the Living Artist Podcast. I'm your host, Preston M. Smith. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Living Artist Podcast. I'm Preston M. Smith, at PMS Artwork Everywhere on Internet Land and Socials. I want to thank you for landing on this podcast. Whether you're a professional artist, just getting started in the art world, a collector of art, or just consider yourself a creative person, this podcast has something for you. I like to think of it as a fun way to rant and talk to other creative people about living the life of an artist, surviving and getting ahead in the art world, and enjoying your life. But most importantly, not waiting until you're dead to make it happen. All right, let's get started. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's also creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. At Cummins, innovation is in our DNA, and we have a history of industry-changing breakthroughs. Now, as we fight climate change and embark on a zero-emission future, we are on the verge of our next big breakthrough. Join us on March 8th and witness history in the making. Find out more at Cummins.tech slash next breakthrough. There we go. Ah, there we are. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Kelly, how are you? I am doing fine. I like your hair. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's it's always a little crazy, but um I like your <laughs> I like the wall behind you. Is this your studio? Well, no, it's I guess uh, it's it's my own room in our house where I hang out and dream up things. Of course. Yeah. You you need a room like that. Yeah. Um, so are you in, I saw, I thought you were in Boulder City, but I think you're in, is it Pioch, Nevada? I was for a lot of years. Okay. Well, I actually moved to Pioch uh-huh. strictly for my art. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, because there's there's uh, like hundreds of mines up there in that area. Yeah, and that's where I get all my art supplies. Oh, that's so cool! Yeah, we're gonna get into all that. I love that. I have a lot of people, a lot of artists who work with found objects. I work with found objects too in some of my paintings. But um, we are. I I should start at the beginning here. We're with Kelly Garney. You are an artist. You're a musician, a reluctant musician, as you say. Uh, yeah. F- founding member of Quiet Riot and basis for Quiet Riot. You've worn many hats and. Yeah, I think we should probably just start at the beginning a little bit. We're going to get into your book. We're going to get into your art. But just for people who are listening to establish who you are, where you came from, uh, we always start with an origin story. Do you want to you want to get us started from an early age through Quiet Riot onto artistry? Sure, absolutely. It, it was an unusual transition. I didn't really know I wanted to be a musician until I met uh, a guy in school by the name of Randy Rhodes. Just a little known guy, yeah. Yeah, very famous guitar player, great guitar player, and extremely wonderful person. And uh, I was so fortunate in that I got to meet him. So we started playing together. Well, I should say he started teaching me bass, and he already knew guitar. And he started teaching me bass, and from there it just progressed. And by the time we were like 13 years old... Pardon me for uh, digressing here, but uh, we met when we were 11. So by the time we were 13, we were already doing uh, a club on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood. Oh, nice. Yeah. And then uh, two years later, Quiet Riot was formed when I was 15. Was this like 1973? uh, 74, I believe. Okay. And we had some pretty good initial success. Uh, to the point where, you know, I ended up in the band until I was 20 years old. Yeah. And at 20, I uh, left the band. I 
made a very strange decision and I became an EMT and I worked uh, ambulance in LA for the next 10 years. Yes. I wanted to ask you about that. That must have been uh, quite the transition from burgeoning rock star to EMT. It, it was it was a huge thing because I, I really wanted to get away from all the music stuff. And I mean, it's a dirty business. Sunset Strip back then was certainly a lot better than it is now. I was recently there and, and I just couldn't wait to get out of there. But yeah. as a kid, of course, it was where I wanted to be every minute of my life. And we were there, you know, as much as we could be. But when Quiet Riot was formed, things changed and music became a business. Mm -hmm. And everything you did, it was all business, business, business. And it just, it just, I, I didn't enjoy it anymore. It, it was a whole different thing than what me and Randy had started out doing. We, we were a couple of kids having fun. Yeah. And all of a sudden, before we were even, you know, legally adults, we're in situations where, you know, I mean, our parents weren't really involved in any decisions that we made when we signed record contracts and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't ask our parents about it. Oh, wow. You were just uh, learning as you went along. Exactly. And at that point, I never had any artistic ambitions. Uh, in fact, in school, what limited amount I did go to. Uh, I I was kicked out of the art class because I found it boring and mm -hmm. I just got in trouble. So they said, you know, get out of here. And, and that's what <laughs> I did. Was it uh, like uh, art history type stuff? Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And going to ambulance to me was such a different thing than what I had been used to. I kind of felt like I was in like this little cocoon in Hollywood where I didn't really know much about anything except this music stuff, the music people, uh, these clubs, the songs, the, you know, all that, you know, I really wanted to do something different and working on an ambulance was so much different. I said, yeah, I like that. Okay. And uh, I really, really enjoyed that career. And you did it for, you said 10 years? Yeah. It, the time came when it was like, okay, I don't, I don't want to look at this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm sure being, uh, well, just for people to back up, Randy Rhodes was like a good friend of yours, you know, from back in the day. And he ended up playing with, I think, Ozzy Osbourne for a while. Yep. Yeah, he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's a he's a big name. And, um, you know, that's that's a pretty big connection to have so early on in life. How did that shape you as an artist or did it? Was it too much being thrown at you at, a, at an early age? The one thing it really taught me was, you know, if you're going to do something, you have to throw your entire self into it. Yeah. And uh, previously, you and I were talking about Pioch. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, was really throwing myself into my art because Pioch is an old ghost town. Maybe some of your listeners have been there. Uh, Probably. There's nothing there. You don't have a store. There's, there's no typical services like you would have in a city. Like if you need a plumber, there isn't one. If you need a veterinarian, there isn't one. Uh, there's doctors 23 miles away and out there, you're not getting the best medical care. There's no hospital. Right. If you up. fall out in the desert while you're looking for an object, you're kind of on your own. Right. But I had just started the art that I was doing, which I need to back up a little bit. I had started to consider being an artist when I was a photographer, which I mm -hmm. eventually ended up doing for 20 years. Yes. And I started that in my early 40s. But up until uh, that point, uh, art never really crossed my mind. I worked ambulance. I worked in music stores. I was a musician. And then it was only when I got older that uh, I began to feel like an artist. After getting a lot of encouragement, I sold a lot of pieces. And and that was very, very encouraging. You know, that told that gave me it qualified me as an artist, a real artist. Definitely. Because to me, if you're not selling anything, you're just doing it for yourself. Yep. Yeah, we all need that validation. I had the same thing, you know. I, I was doing art for many years and I would sell the odd piece to a friend here and there or a family member, but it wasn't until I started really selling to people who didn't know me from around the world that I was like, okay, 
this, I, I'm on to something here, you know? So yeah, we all do need that validation as artists. Yeah. So, you know, after, after, you know, the early part of my life in my forties, here I am as a, a photographer and I'm just shooting models and headshots for actors. And I got uh, in Las Vegas. I mean, it was a great time uh, to be a, a decent photographer. There was a lot of work to be had. Oh, I didn't sure. have a whole lot of competition. And it was there that eventually what started happening was I started doing a lot of nudes. Mm -hmm. uh, not of myself. Uh, of Bob. <laughs> People are going to be buying the books. It's like, where I thought I thought I was going to see some Kelly Garney nudes here. Yeah, yeah there actually is one of me in there. <laughs> oh, I, I missed that. All right. Now I have to go back. <laughs> well, no, it's I, I'm, I'm like one years old or something. Oh, so. there you go. There you go. That's the only way I can get away with it. I yeah, that's when it's safe. Yeah. So. But did you, can I back up real quick? Did you first start shooting models in LA when you were doing as an EMT? No. Well, okay. that's actually where it started. Yeah. yeah, I I did buy a camera while I was working ambulance. Uh, mm -hmm. A friend or uh, my driver, who was also my friend that day, uh, she brought a camera to work. I saw a good looking girl at a bus stop. I wanted to meet her. I jumped out with the camera. I took her picture. She gave me her phone number. And I said, hey, man, quickest I got a phone number since being <laughs> in a rock band. <laughs> right. And I did go out with the girl. Oh, wow. The, the camera seemed to have a magic power over women. That's how it looked to me. Right, right. And uh, so for 20 years, I took pictures. The last, probably about six years into it, after doing models, I began to get a lot of calls from escort services. Mm -hmm. Now, this is Las Vegas. Yeah, Vegas. So escort services are like, you know, a dime a dozen, quite literally. Right. And so I, I, I was doing all these nudes and, you know, a certain point had to come where I had to discern between natural instincts versus professionalism. Right. And luckily that, that came really easily to me. Yeah. Uh, I was normally involved with somebody, either a girlfriend or a wife. And, um, you know, that gave me a great focus uh, to concentrate on while I was working. Definitely. But it also helped. By then, I had shot so many girls that it just didn't even have an effect on me. And by the way, we should back up. Kelly Garney's new book is called Naked Vegas. And you can read all about all this. And there, there's some pretty <laughs> there's some pretty funny stories. There's some pretty there it is right there. I got my yeah. copy. Here I should I should hold mine up too. Ready? Hey, there we Boom, go. Boom, there it is. All right. Um, when I, I, I don't normally uh, publish these as videos, but sometimes I use clips and stuff. So maybe we'll put this in. You can read about all this in Naked Vegas. There's some really funny stuff in there. There's some touching stuff in there. There's some pretty uh, crazy, you know, borderline scandalous stuff in there too. Uh, what I but could it, have written. What I yeah, could have written. Right, right. It's a very, I was thinking when I was reading it, I was like, wow, Kelly should be selling this to uh you know hbo or something doing some some episodic of this because you got a lot of great stories in there but but continue sorry you'd been doing model shoots for a while you had done some news i remember seeing you had like 50 percent of your business was coming from nudes at the time and yeah. then i think you can correct me if i'm wrong but the business started to transition a bit the world started to transition a bit with 9 11 yeah. and you lost a lot of your business uh before that and so you kind of transitioned into this. Am I correct? You are absolutely correct. And I have I know who the culprit is, and it's digital photography. Once once digital hit, that was it for guys like me. I mean, guys like me, I shoot with black and white film. I developed it myself. I printed it myself. Uh, I had to look at negatives through loops yeah. and with light boxes. And, you know, it was a whole lot simpler. And the picture was basically what you got there wasn't a whole lot of manipulation in the dark room you can you can adjust uh contrast things like that you can even soften but if if there's something that needs to be photoshopped out well guess what you're out of luck unless yeah. you're some kind of a master retoucher which i don't even know how that art works but yeah um, the point came in the development of the art where when I started shooting artistic nudes, 
Now, since I had so many girls around, that it was pretty easy for me to get models because, and I was good friends with all of them. Yeah, you know, and I'd ask them, "Hey, I, I have some ideas for some shots I want to do. You know, can we go out somewhere and do this?" And and boy, I mean, they just they just jumped at the chance. I mean, I had a a good stable of about a dozen models of very beautiful girls who were always down to go somewhere weird like Death Valley or some abandoned place somewhere out in the desert. And it often wasn't uh, very, you know, hospitable for humans. Uh, right. Sand storms. I've had swarms of, of killer bees come down on me. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it, you know, it was, it was, it was brutal. So, you know, somebody pointed out to me that, that, you know, I should start selling these things. And I was like, okay. And I was able to secure uh, an art gallery that would host one of my shows. Mm -hmm. I made up a bunch of prints, all print, hand printed, you know, 20 by 24s and big stuff. And it went over really well. And that's when I said, okay, so now I'm an artist. And that is what got screwed up by digital because when digital came along people could manipulate pictures any way they wanted and photos weren't really real anymore and yep. it kind of broke my heart because yeah. you know if i shot something i made sure it was perfect i, I did go on to be a wedding photographer near the end when i couldn't make any money at all doing the models because they just had their girlfriend or something shoot them with their phone yes you know? so yes <clears throat> that's the new world that was the new world that that came at me that eventually led into a whole new art form that had nothing to do with digital and um and that is where the found objects came in yeah yeah that's awesome i just felt like an artist and i had to do something artistic and i always i was always fascinated by these objects and i said i think i can do something with them and it developed from there yeah well, one of the things that I was fascinated with with your story was the adaptability and the transitions that you had. Like I, I have it written down here. It's, you know, you went from rock star to MT to hobbyist photographer to professional photographer, post 9-11, you know, career shifting, wedding photography to artist, to found object artist. And correct me if I'm wrong, but is Ghost Town Art, it's also kind of a gallery slash coffee shop. I didn't really get into that too much, but I saw something online. Yeah, that, you know, I've never written about that. And I would kind of like to write a book about my experiences in Pioche because it, it was a whole different thing coming from where I went and going and living in a town of 700 people, you know, very, very, very remote town. Yeah. Um, it was a wild experience. But I went there with the only expectation of wanting to go to all of these mines and get these great supplies I was using. And the mines up there were, were fantastic. In fact, I'm going back up there in the spring, go to one special mine that absolutely nobody can get to unless you have a guide. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I know the guide. I've been there. So we'll be putting um, links in the show notes. No, just kidding. Yeah. But Ghost Town Art and Coffee was a restaurant that I came up with up there because the town only had one restaurant and they were horrible. So I had a building. It was located right across the street from my house and I was using it uh, as an art, art workroom. It was my studio and it was a messed up building. It was built in 1865 and it hadn't been a business in over 60 years. Really? It just sat there. And nobody saw anything cool about this building. It was a cool building. It was an old tin shack, painted silver, with a, a special um, aluminum-colored paint that was only used on aircraft mm -hmm. and is unavailable now. You, there was no way I could even repaint the building. You can't get this paint anymore. So, oh, really? Yeah. So I was able to paint the trim up. I fixed the place up. I cleaned it out, which was a, a huge, huge mess. I had uh, an unbelievable price as far as rent. I really wanted to buy the building, but the owner wouldn't sell it. So the money was good as far as just keeping it around. It wasn't that expensive. The yeah, only way to beat it was a wood-burning stove. 
Nice. And if you Old have a wood burning stove, you know what you get to do? Cut wood. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Right. I'm sure it keeps your cost down, but it's a little bit of physical labor. Yeah. Well, you know, eventually I decided to turn it into a restaurant and a uh, coffee shop. And I added the art in there, too. I was already hanging it on the wall anyway when I finished pieces. Yeah. And just so I could look at them. And I was able to turn it into a restaurant, which out there was very easy because, believe me, if I tried to open up, if I took that whole building and I put it in any big city anywhere, the health department would say, this isn't happening. Done. Yep. But, you know, for up there, it was good enough. And it was very clean. My family owned restaurants and I grew up in my young years in restaurants. And uh, so I knew the restaurant business. I also knew how to keep things clean and, you know, that kind of stuff. I renovated part of the uh, building and able to facilitate a a very, very nice, clean restaurant Mm -hmm. where we could cook and store food, all that kind of stuff. And then the whole front of, of the place, I left it rustic. And people enjoyed just being in a building that old. It was it was sort of, the town was so remote and so off the wall, had all these big Wild West tales going for it. And uh, it attracted a lot of tourists. So the business actually did very, very well. Nice. I would have gone there for sure. Oh, yeah. You, you would have loved it, the area. I loved it. I loved living there. I loved, uh, you know, the open land around me. I mean, I took a five minute drive with my dog and we were out in the middle of nowhere, you know, shooting off guns, which my dog loves guns. For oh, sure. really? She loves to chase bullets. <laughs> Has she ever caught one? No. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be careful of that. Yeah. She, she's pretty on it. She's right on it. So, oh, wow. Um, but anyways, that, that played itself out to where there really wasn't that much business anymore. Yeah, but I'm assuming the with a town there, of 700 the, people, it must be hard to get consistent turnover as a business. I was in the restaurant yeah. business, too, before I became a full-time painter. It, it was getting kind of hard on me, too, because, I mean, it's very cold up there. I'm from California and Nevada. Yeah. yeah. You know, I I don't know about living in the snow. I had never even driven in the snow my entire life until I moved to that place. Oh, I'm sure that was a, an eye opener. I learned how to drive in the snow. So you know what driving in black ice is like then. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. It's a different it, it, animal. To get the supplies for my restaurant, it was a hundred mile journey into Utah, mm-hmm. the Cedar City, and on a, on a two lane road with barely seeing anybody you sure didn't see any cops or anything i mean if something right. happened out there you were in a lot of trouble oh yeah you had you had very very spotty cell surface or uh cell- cellular service and uh i've had to drive out to cedar in absolute blizzards where you couldn't even see i know exactly what you're talking about i grew up in wyoming and my dad would drive oh, okay. in blizzards where you couldn't see i'm i'm not kidding you couldn't see a foot in front of your windshield yeah, Scary. it was terrifying. And then add in a bunch of deer that want to jump in front of you. Yes. Regional cow wandering around in the road. <laughs> <laughs> there, There is nothing. There's like, oh, I need some help. You know, I can't, I don't, my phone won't work out here. Oh, I'll just go over to that house there. There's no houses. There's nobody. Right. Yeah, so, it's dangerous. You know, it kind of seemed like, the smart thing to do was was to get out of there. Luckily, I met uh, my wife, and she lived in Phoenix at the time, and she suggested I move there, and we got married shortly thereafter. Mm-hmm. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me because that really opened up my art world and gave me a lot of freedom yeah. uh, to uh, pursue what I do now. Congratulations on that. Before I forgot, uh, I was looking at, at Ghost Town Art, and I saw on there, I don't know if it's a, it's the same thing, but it's, there's a website up. I'm not sure if it's affiliated with, with the restaurant, if it was something where you showed these artists in the establishment. But I noticed that you had Debbie Corbell on the website. And she's a friend of mine from Los Angeles. And she's actually been on the podcast. And I saw her on the website. And I was like, oh, wow. I was, I was wondering if Debbie knew you. Debbie Corbell? Yes. She does kind of like found object sculptures too, like horses and 
some like kind of sexual funny characters and crows and she's really good. Well, uh, you know, I had a lot of artists come through my place, actually. Yeah. Uh, I was doing art shows down in Las Vegas. Uh, in, in Las Vegas, they have a big arts district and uh, they have a thing called First Friday. So I was always at every First Friday in yeah. a gallery. I met a lot of artists and and yeah, she came up and and looked at what I did after seeing what I did. Because because I always said to, to people, I said, if you want to see how this is created, come to where it comes from. Yes. You have to go to the, the source of these materials. And you have to kind of feel like the the vibration that this old stuff gives you. I don't know if it makes you an empath or what, but when I pick up things off the ground, you know, my first thought is, oh, you know, who had this? What what did they use it for? And and what what did it do? And and I think about you know what life was like. I won't pick up anything unless it's a hundred years old. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I'm telling you, Kelly, this is your third book right here that's like endlessly fascinating i think you've only written the two right yeah yeah, yeah okay okay yeah. yeah so here's your third book this is the trilogy is uh ending with the found objects and and these old objects you're finding out in the the desert and the mines that's that's amazing yeah it's it's some of them can be kind of scary i mean uh you get to some of these mines and it's just a big deep hole that just gradually goes down 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 and you can't even with a flashlight, you don't see any end. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, up there, they got mountain lions and things like that. And I was always right. scared something was going to jump out and get me. You know, of course, you go armed because it's just you're out in the middle of nowhere. And yeah, you don't know what's going to get you. Mountain lions were about the scariest thing I had to deal with up there. I didn't have any bears or anything, which probably in wyoming you got chased around by a few bears oh we have yeah we had some bear incidents for sure but you also <laughs> had some kind of going back to the book you had a couple of run-ins with tigers right you want to tell us yeah, any of those I stories I was a photographer and i i did a lot of vegas acts i did uh impersonators what i one of my regrets about my book is i didn't go into you know how much uh i had shot drag queens oh really yeah, I didn't know that. And I really enjoyed that, actually. Yeah. It was kind of like hanging out with the guys, but you're not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, and that's something I, that's I very think, present you know, in our culture right now, you know? Oh, yeah. Things have changed. Uh, and yeah. that's great. I think yeah. that's great because it was too. a great experience. I got to work with some some pretty, pretty prestigious uh, drag queens or female impersonators, I suppose, is the more. Uh, correct term. I never got to work with RuPaul, but I did work with Frank Marino uh -huh. because Joan Rivers thing yeah. and had uh, shows. I did all the photography for his shows. Wow. And I also worked with Kenny Kerr, who was another prominent female impersonator. Mm -hmm. I saw you did Magicians as well. And uh, you had, didn't you have one pretty famous magician who passed away? And it, the photography that you did of him was at the funeral, wasn't it? Yeah. His name was Chappie Brazil. Mm. And he was doing very, very well on the strip, had had great shows at good hotels. And, um, I, you know, he was, gosh, he was just such a good looking guy. He was like gorgeous. Yeah. Like Brad Pitt kind of good looking. Oh, wow. And, um, and, he, and he chose to be a magician. <laughs> yeah, and he was really good at it, and he rode a motorcycle, which always scared me. I'm not real big on motorcycles after working ambulance for so many years. Oh, know, yeah. You say, okay, I don't think I'll ever get into that. But sadly, yeah, he died on that. But those were the kind of people I was getting, and that's where the Tigers came in. I had a mm -hmm. guy that had a show uh, at the Tropicana on the Strip called uh, the Bird Band of Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And he had lots of trained birds. So I started out doing all these birds, every kind of bird you can think of. I mean, even like vultures, which are much larger than you think. Yes. Uh, I mean, they, they came up to like here on me. They're tall. Oh, wow. Wow. They're big. Yeah. And they are indeed ugly. Uh, yeah. so, For those of you who are not watching this, he's uh, motioning to the top of his chest. So they are very tall. <laughs> You know, that he got into tigers, which mm -hmm. I didn't think was too good of an idea. 
you know. I'm a big believer in do good one thing and do it very well. Right. And he was good with the birds. But then he got into the Tigers. And I think he did it mostly because Vegas was a big tiger town. Started Definitely. by Victory and Roy with their whole white tigers thing. You know, suddenly everybody, well, you got to have a tiger if you want to be in this showroom, you know. If you want to be relevant, you got to have a tiger. Yeah. Yeah. So he got, he got some cats. He started out with cheetahs and uh, panthers and black panther. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, those things were mean. And I'm sure. He, you know, he did an okay job of training them. They didn't kill anybody ever. There were some close calls. I did get grabbed by one once. Yeah. As I talked about in my book. And uh, it was it was a terrifying feeling. The amount of strength that that thing had, it, it was just absolutely incredible. Yep. And I had worked with that tiger since it was a little cub. Now it was full grown and, and weighed, you know, what, four or five hundred pounds, six. I don't know. You know? Yeah. Well, even Siegfried and Roy, they had a run in and they trained these tigers. You never know what's going to catch the tiger's eye and set it off. And, you know, while I was doing all this stuff, that happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then it was like, oh, these tigers, you know. (laughs) And I remember one thing I never I didn't put this story in my book, but I went over to the guy's house. I spent a lot of time over there shooting birds and 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 the cats. But uh, he had a lion. So I had a um, uh, escort who wanted a shot with a male lion. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now you want to talk about big. That's really big. Yes. So we're in the bathroom and we're, she's getting ready, you know, I'm helping her, I'm helping her with makeup, and the clothes and all this, you know, and the bathroom windows open, you know, and we can hear him out by the, the lion cage and we hear this horrible, horrible fight going on. And we're both like looking at each other going, what the hell is going on out there? You know, geez, it sounds terrible. You know, it sounded sounded like he was dying or something. So we closed the window. We shut, slammed the door and locked it. And we just stayed quiet. We were scared to death. Oh, my God. And uh, it just turned out that him and the lion had a disagreement. And he came back in after a little while, and he was, he was pretty bloody. Oh, and, my uh, God. <laughs> oh, we yeah. just had a disagreement. He's missing an arm. Right, right. <laughs> it's just <laughs> wow. a flesh wound. And, <laughs> just a uh, flesh wound, exactly. Yeah. So he says, well, uh, I don't think we'll be using the lion today. You know, we'll we'll use uh, a leopard. And I'm like, oh, great. Okay. Oh, wow. And he, he seemed to have more control over them, but. But yeah, I worked with with the lions, tigers. Uh, I worked with an elephant. I worked with uh, the elephant. Uh, her name is Ty. She was in the movie Water for Elephants. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. just an amazing experience to touch and be with a creature like that. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. That's one creature that I've never had any experience with. Is an elephant that I've always wanted to. Yeah, it, once you do, you will never forget it the rest of your life. That's amazing. Well, so many great stories. I wanted to highlight, first of all, that people who want to venture into your backstory can pick up your other book, too. Uh, Angels with Dirty Faces. Oh, this he's got it. Here. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't get into that one, but um, I have read it's about it. a little thick, yes. Yeah, I've read reviews. I've heard really good stuff. This is more of a kind of behind the music story yeah. from, the early, from the earlier days. So you can get the Kelly Garney from the early days, a lot of the the gossip that is going to go along with some of that stuff. Cause when you uh, Google you, you can see some of that gossip and that's just, yeah, that's just what happens. I've done all sorts of things. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But then uh, naked Vegas is the transition into the photography and then you're venturing into the art world. And then we're looking for book three coming out soon about uh, the the minds. But did you want to share any, other stories. I know I've got some stuff here like tigers. I've got mobsters. I've got your your studio was broken into. Some crazy things with preachers, pimps, <laughs> a- a- anything. You can highlight any of those and, and give us one if, if you want just to whet people's appetite for the book. Well, now I'm going to have to really look through my brain here and <laughs> find a doozy. I just thought of one the other day, too, that I was like, I can't believe that happened. Uh, yeah. You know, Things were actually pretty normal for me. The girls were always easy to work with. 
Mm-hmm. So there wasn't too much drama with them. They were very professional. Yeah. Uh, it was when you got into the people that weren't used to being models and, you know, out there. Right. That would be weddings. Yes. And I have about a thousand weird wedding stories I could tell. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you, Kelly, because it was funny because you get into the further section of the book. And when you get into the weddings, and I think you shot something like 500 weddings. I did. Um, yeah. And I mean, you must have crazy stories. But I was starting to see some of the parallels between like some of the old stuff, the crazy stuff, and then just what you think of as just a nice wedding. But how those kind of just devolved into like debauchery and, <laughs> and craziness. So go go ahead. People could only hear the stories that go on in, like, say, uh, the room where the brides are getting married yeah, or or the room where they're getting ready. And all the bridesmaids are there. And as soon as mom leaves the room, the stories start. (laughs) Now, you go into the groom's room where they're all getting ready. And they're talking about the bachelor party, which was last night. They're right. all over, you know. I felt pretty bad for a lot of girls who were getting married. Oh, I'm sure. I also felt pretty bad for a lot of guys that got married after hearing the stories these girls told about their bachelor parties. So, oh wow. Parties. So, so the bachelor parties and the bachelorette parties—that's where the real dirt is, right there. Yes. Um, and definitely, you know, at weddings themselves, you had, you know, as I talk about in my book, you know, you had uh, fights, uh, you you had uh, dynamics of family that, that you know, were sometimes making the whole day difficult. Mm-hmm. That was probably the worst thing right there, because I got very close with these people. You have to. Yeah, definitely. It was the same with, with shooting the artistic nudes is I was very, very close to these girls. And we spent a lot of time talking and we knew a lot about each other and we were always great friends. And that made the pictures just, it gave them a little extra light. And and I'm sure it also made them comfortable and and feel safe too. Yeah. Yeah. And very much like Ambulance, where my main goal, uh, first off, when I was getting a patient was, I got to get them confident and comfortable and believing in me real quick. Otherwise, things aren't going to go good for them well it's a lot like that in a wedding you know you get to cut the families to like you and 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 they start you know saying well this guy's going to do a good job and they feel comfortable around you and and the more you can try to kind of be like them the better so you you did a lot of acting yeah and um but it's the weddings where the weird stuff really happened (laughs) and i traveled a lot which was nice i got to go to a lot of cool places Mm-hmm. And um, everything was always paid for, and the weddings paid really good money. But you know, in the end, it, it just uh, you sometimes walked away from the wedding going, "That's not going to last." Yeah, <laughs> and this yeah. is after you know you get this bonding with with the bride and the groom to get right. that great shot, and and then you after the wedding and you see the family dynamics and 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 their friends and and the things that you know occurred you know before they even got married it it just made you feel bad yeah i'm sure it could be a little bit depressing could almost do a behind you know behind the music you could do a behind the wedding and 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 see all that how many of them last what were the dynamics going on but cuz yeah. i'm sure you were as a photographer you kind of blended in a little bit with either the crowd the group that was in there or the background even almost yeah. like the silent observer. So you probably have some <laughs> really good stories from that too. That's, that's the way I played it. I mean, you know, while I did have to get a good relationship going with my clients, you know, in the course of the ceremony that, of you know, the ceremony, the, the reception, all that stuff, you know, yeah, you do have to kind of blend in. Yeah. Sadly, I didn't really look like a photographer. I mean, I had enough trouble coming up with how to look like a photographer anyway when I was doing the models. Yes. I wanted to look because that's what I knew. I knew uh, you need to have an image. You need to have a look. That's what I learned yeah. from the music business. Yeah, so it's true. So the same thing applied when I became a photographer. So I went with this hippie desert rep kind of a deal. Well, I just took that guy and I put nicer clothes on him 
yeah. for the weddings. Yeah. You know, I got a black lambskin vest and photographer's vest and, you know, I got nicer shoes and, and, um, I always like to wear a bandana because I have crappy hair. In fact, now is the best hair I've ever had in my life because it's all gone. But, um, <laughs> but uh, it was very thin hair. He's wearing a hat, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was very thin hair. And for photography, it gets in front of your face and your eyes and the lens and, and all that. So I always wore a bandana, which kind of stood out a little bit. So as yeah. much as I tried to be invisible, I did stand out, had a different look than other wedding photographers. I mean, other wedding photographers, I looked at them, they show up in a tuxedo. Yeah. I'm like, no, nah, that's not going to be me because sometimes I'll lay right on the ground to do a shot, you know? And Right. And so dressing like that just was not an option for me. Well, it's almost like the, you're saying the desert rat hippie who cleans up well. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's funny, it sounds crazy, but it's true. Like in the music business, like in the art world, like in the acting world, whatever people have to come up with some sort of an image. Uh, it's, you know, you're almost branding yourself. I'm sure you stood out as a wedding photographer because people remembered you. They were like, Oh, let's get this guy, you know, who looks like the desert rat hippie who cleans up well, you know what I mean? <laughs> that was me. I don't need another person who you know, blends in with a tuxedo. Yeah. Yeah. Also you were talented too. That, that helps. I, I really love photography and I love the language of light. Light to me was a language and I felt like I spoke it very well. Um, when I shot film, I could just look at any scene or situation. I rarely metered it because mm -hmm. I just knew, Oh, that's, you know, uh, 60 at F eight or six, 60 at F six, 5.6. You know, I just could read the light. And mm -hmm. so light was a great thing. And that's what I really feel that that digital destroyed about photography was the language of light. It was all about light. Yeah. Yeah. And I used and to teach. I had students. I used to get all my interns from uh, UNLV in Las Vegas and who all later went into business. And I learned not to get students because what happens is you teach them really well and they go out and they open a business. And right. that's what happened to me. So I quit teaching. They but, steal all your ideas. Yeah. But the, one of the first things I taught them was I said, the meaning of photography is painting with light. I love it. A literal translation. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and bearing that in mind, that was that was one of the most important things I ever learned, because that really clarified how photography worked to me. I said, aha, it's about light. Mm -hmm. And. When you first start out, of course, you're mostly dealing with outside sunlight, shade. And then once you get into the studio and you're pointing lights, specific lights, light temperatures, tungsten, yeah. uh, fluorescent lights or green on, on color film, all these little things you had to start considering. Digital took all that away. Yep. And that's that's what got me into the found objects, because I just said, hey, nobody can duplicate this. You can't. You know, you're not going to replace this with a computer. It's a one of a kind, unique object that you're creating with your own hands. And I want to tell you, Kelly, because we just had a meeting and we were talking with a bunch of people and we were talking about the future of art a little bit. And I don't know if you know this, you probably do. There's a lot of AI generated art now. And yes, I didn't know that. I've seen pictures of me that somebody took. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, but don't do that to me. <laughs> yeah, that's the big thing on Instagram now. But I, I see a lot of people. Well, it's basically just you have a program, you give it a prompt, or you give it, you know, whatever words, expressions, descriptions, and then it just creates and it creates something in a style of this, it can do anything that you want. And it's really, if you thought that digital was the death of photography, it really is now we had a photographer and there was just saying, you know, you can't, you can't compete with it. And there's going to become a fight at some point, I think of of what's real art, you know, art is, uh, I think art is made by a human being. And until people stop making money off the AI art, it's going to keep going on. And it's, it's kind of sad. You know, you, you really have to have an emotional attachment to your own, to your materials. Yes. Let, let's say you make, you know, you work with clay, you're a sculptor or anything like that. You've got your hands right on this uh, stuff and you're working with it. 
Steven uh, Spielberg once said something that really stuck with me about being a filmmaker. He said that he loved the way film felt in his fingers. Mm. He he said that he loved what it could do. And he said he loved to hold it. And that always stuck with me. And I always, because I was like, that was, I read that when I was a photographer. And I said, I do like the way my film feels. Yeah. And so when I work with my metal and I'm bending it and, and, you know, positioning it, you know, on, on what I call canvases, you know, it feels like, it feels more real to me. Mm-hmm. And to me, all this AI and the digital and all that, it's not real. It's not real. And it's not made by a human being. Even yeah. there's even CGI artists who have talent, who they're, they're actually putting it together. I mean, they're using a computer, but they're talking with a computer and they're using their skill with their hands. That's gone now. It's like, it's, it's right. just completely computer generated. Yeah. You yeah. know, let's just take a, a painter, for instance. I mean, you know, this could be applied to just about any art form, but yeah. a painter, a good painter, he knows what his paint tastes like. He knows oh. what it smells like. I love the smell of oil paint. I love it. There you go. Yeah. And this you don't get with the computer stuff. Right. You just get a sore back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Also, Kelly, you know, people are interested in the artist. Like, they're actually interested in your story, too. Like, I want a Kelly Garney piece because, first of all, I love the art, but also because I identify with Kelly and his story and his struggles and what he puts into his art. There's, like, this intangible thing that goes into your art that's completely unique because of your story, too. And you can't get that with yeah. AI art either. No, no. When when I When I do art shows... I always encourage people, touch my art. Put your yes. hand right on it. Yes. I mean, you know, here's an example. You know, I've been making clocks. Oh, this is great. Here, let me let me enhance your video here so I can see it. This clock is not oh, running. Wow. It has no battery. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. I just wanted to I wanted to make some spiders and I I I had never done spider webs, so I did this. And the uh, Actual spiders are made out of uh, uh, the kind of like if you see like a piece of furniture Mm that has like the metal studs in it. Yes. This was this was found off of a very, very old couch and uh, it has holes for nails to go through. Ah, yes. It was big, long lengths of it. So I ripped it all off of this old couch that was basically rotted away and um, and I was able to make the spiders out of it. That's so cool. And so I tell people, you know, put your hands right on it. Touch it. Yes. You know, this stuff that I do, it's tough. It doesn't fall apart. Yes. The way I do it. And it took a lot of trial and error to figure that one out. And what is the background piece there, Kelly? The background piece is a uh, old piece of uh, probably the side of somebody's house. Okay. Or it could be their roof. Yeah. <laughs> or it could be off an old shed. It's, it's oh, that's these awesome. Old, um, pieces of tin that people used to put on the outsides of their houses like a, like an aluminum siding type right yeah. yeah yeah but prior to to it being galvanized and and being silver it was just steel and it would rust so yes. this this stuff is actually really valuable to me i go out in the desert to certain locations and i'll bring back like a truckload and they they typically any well if they were cut they, you know they could be just about any size Mm-hmm. But uh, when you bought a piece of this back, even in those days, and still to this day, they come in eight foot lengths. And I'll sometimes bring back eight foot lengths of them. Oh, wow. The whole side of my house has a whole bunch of steel like this. Have you ever made a piece out of the full eight foot piece? Not eight feet, but I have plenty that are like two feet by three feet. Yeah. Yeah, that's big. So, yeah, I mean, the touch, the smell, the feel, the the scent, uh, the taste of art. I'm not saying, you know, please lick my art. <laughs> but Maybe I'm that could be a new you know, thing. The artist, you know, who works very closely with their materials, like sculptor wood or, you know, someone doing clay, you know, they, they have a very, very intimate uh, experience with the materials that they use, as I do. Definitely. Uh, with this steel. I go out in the middle of the desert i pick it up off the ground i I feel like i'm rescuing it yeah you know 
I get that feeling. And then, you know, I, I do something with it and it has a whole new life. And exactly. all that's important to me as an artist that I feel that way. But with, again, going back to the digital stuff, you get none of that. So Nothing. to me, you're not even an artist. You're, you're, you know, a digital manipulator. Well, and some people now it's, it's gone so far as it's not even artists at all. It's just somebody trying to make a quick buck. They get a, a computer program and then they yeah. just, you know, churn out this AI art and try to make a quick buck on online from it. And look, it's going to get to a place where there's going to be a lot of, you know, litigation and, you know, if some of them are stealing styles of people, like if they wanted like, oh, I want this in the style of Kelly Garney, the computer will recognize that. And then it'll start to manipulate the photo in your style. So there's got, you know, people are going to get sued for that eventually, I think. Oh, I could easily see that happening way down the road. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's really going to get to the point where you're going to really start questioning anything. You, you go to the, the store. Yeah. And you buy a steak and you go. How do I know they didn't use a 3D printer to make this steak? Right. <laughs> well, they're making vegan steaks now. They're, they're, that's what they're doing. So, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah you never know. Well, and also, eating one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, you know, if you look at the tabloids too, all these computer generated images, you could just manipulate anybody. Oh, well, so and so was here doing this act. That's all in question now. Everything's yeah. in question. It's yeah. a brave new world. But, We'll get back to your story. And um, oh, I wanted to ask you about galleries. Are you currently showing your work anywhere? Or are you selling your work uh, um, through your website on your own? I'm selling uh, my work right now on online only because, quite frankly, I sold all my art. So now I'm like restocking. Yes. So I'm working as fast as I can. Thank God I, I can turn out one of these clocks in about three weeks. But if I do a, a larger piece, you know, you're talking, you know, maybe three months. Yeah. Um, so I'm currently working on getting a, a stock of that. The only thing I have coming up is uh, I have a book signing at a bookstore called the Copper Cat mm -hmm. in uh, Henderson, Nevada. That's on uh, February 4th. And 4th, I will okay. have art there for sale as well. Oh, nice. So, I learned one lesson already is I posted a picture of one of my clocks on Facebook and 20 minutes later it was sold. And I said, no, no, no. You, I just wanted you to look at it. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to get a bunch of this stuff, you know, <laughs> you know, so because yeah. you get the satisfaction of somebody, you know, coming to your space in a gallery and looking at your stuff and going, oh, I just love that. Oh, tell me about it. You know, yeah, that's all great. You know, these people are just like, Hey, I really like that. I'll buy it. How much, you know? Yeah. And, and that's the end of the sale. And you put it in a box and ship it off. And I much prefer that the gallery experience of meeting people and explaining, you know, what's behind all this. I have, I have pictures of most of the locations where all this stuff came from. Yeah. And I have a TV screen set up for uh, my book signings that has as a uh, uh, a whole show on where it all comes from. And uh, it's like a slideshow kind of thing, interspaced with some video in there. Mm -hmm. And it shows the, how remote these locations are I go to. And people love to see that. They love to see where this stuff came from. It's places that don't, they, they may never go. Yeah. Well, that enhances the experience of not only, you know, talking to you and buying the art, but then when they tell people who see the art on their wall, they have all that background information. They have a story about their art. Exactly. That's so important, too. There are yeah. ways you can kind of do that online, but but for somebody like you who's so specific, who works so hands-on, who finds these things in such remote locations, that's really hard to encapsulate online. It, it's better yeah. to, to talk to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not going to put any more pictures online. I mean, I have a few pieces on my website, you know, just so there's something there. But I'll, yeah. I'll tell you what, if I sell them, we're going to have to redecorate a room or something because they're all hanging all over my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of these are good problems to have, Kelly, but but yeah. Yeah, that's... yeah that is a good problem to have. Yeah, I, yeah, I sure. agree with that. <laughs> but, and this um, is, um, so if you go to kellygarney.com, you can buy, go buy Naked Vegas. And I saw you have some original pieces up there as well. Yeah, yeah. We're redoing that website. It was horribly done. It, it's... Uh, taking some undertaking to get it redone. So 
Yeah. Uh, it needs to be redone. It was, it was just a terrible job. And that's, that's lazy digital work right there. Yeah. You, know, you have all these things you can do and you're getting paid for it and you do that kind of a job. Yeah. You know? Well, and that's the thing too, with websites are such a pain in the ass because you're always having to update them. You know, I mean, you could have the best website for 2022, but in 2032, it's going to be crap again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but, but your site, like when I was on your site, it, it it looks good. It's passable, but I can see that you've got some other stuff in the works, which will be good. So is there anywhere else people can like buy your work? I saw you have stuff on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Amazon? Yeah, they can, they can contact me directly if they want a signed copy. Oh, nice. Um, that's probably the best way to do it. You actually get a better deal through me. Mm -hmm. And depending upon which book, if you if you buy my uh, Angels book, Angels with Dirty Faces, uh, I usually send a couple little goodies along with that. Um, nice. For the Naked Vegas book, I haven't really figured out anything to send people yet. And really, you know, I wrote the book and, and I would actually encourage other artists to do this. If they've got something to write about, uh, they should write a book. No matter what it is, you know, I mean, I, I, I've I, written I've written myself. Kill. I've written two or three books, too. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. I, yeah, I love it. It's great. It's just another another avenue. Some of them are autobiographical. Some of them are complete fiction. But it's just another form of expression that I, I love. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, particularly if you buy or um, you write a book about yourself or something that you did, it's, you know, some sort of a journey you've been on. Yeah. I, you know, when I do uh, art shows in the galleries, I always have a lot of books to sell. Yes. Smart. And they sell well. Yeah. So now you've got two types of income coming in. And this this book here, I mean, this book I kind of had to write. Yeah. It just simply because of the, you know, gravity of my past. Yeah, the um, rumors and the misconceptions. Yeah, I wanted to clear a lot of things up. So, yeah. you know, you're going to find more fan kind of people that buy a book like this. Mm -hmm. This, the naked book, I bought strictly, you know, to enhance my art shows. I wanted people to know about, you know, the weird journey I went on to finally do what I really love to do. Yeah. But the two of them together give you a total it, picture. It, it's a good business thing to do. You know? Yeah, for sure. Because you're getting to know Kelly Garney, the person as well, and the artist and the musician. And, and the all, yeah, all this. And it enhances your experience of of buying art as well. Yeah, so, it does. It does. Yeah. yeah. It gives you something to talk about and it makes your conversations with potential customers, you know, that much easier and better. You yes. know, oh, by the way, I wrote a book. You yes. Know? And um, you know, they'll you generally pick it up and start looking at it, you know, before they even look at your art. Yeah. Well, and your book is is laid out well. It's um it is autobiographical. I probably took me like to really get into it. A day and a half to digest. You could read it in a day. Um, yeah, easily, easily. Yeah, easily. But there's such great stories and photos in there. Some beautiful photos. There's some semi scandalous stuff in here that's great for for readers. And uh, I mean, I, the one thing that I wanted to say to you that I love as an artist and that I admire as writers and musicians and whatever form of art you do is honesty. You know, you're very honest with your stories with your life and i think you know that's so important for for people nowadays just to kind of get more attached to you as an artist and as, as a human being so thank you for being honest and writing these books oh well thank you for the compliment you know yeah. everybody th the best compliments i get from people are uh well particularly on on naked vegas you know there's there's over 250 pictures of naked women in this book yeah people tell me you know what after I started reading the story, I didn't even notice the pictures. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and it's also, there's some very beautiful pictures in there. There's some very artistic pictures in there. Um, one that just pops to mind is the one with the lighting behind the pregnant woman. That's a beautiful, oh. that's a beautiful photograph. There's a lot of really good art, artsy stuff in there. I know you had your cowgirl series as well. 
And that's yeah. all very interesting and 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 fun. The black and whites, those are great. Um, and you have, you know, you have some pictures in there of musicians' hands and other stuff like that, weddings. There's a lot for anybody who's interested in photography, not just the nudes, but the nudes are also very are beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing about the nudes is by now, you know, a lot of these were taken in the 90s and the very, very early 2000s. Yeah. So here it is, you know, getting on 2023. So this stuff is vintage now. <laughs> you know, yeah, for sure. Girl, these beautiful girls are all now great grandmothers. So oh, isn't that crazy? Yeah. And and the big difference, too, is if I tried to do a book like this now, I almost couldn't because there's no girls out there without a tattoo of some sort. Yeah. I think in this whole book, there's one tattoo on a girl. But girls yeah, back then think. didn't have tattoos. That's now, true. You know, they got their face, their neck, you know. <laughs> God knows yep. what else is going on, you know. Yep, yep. And so girls just don't even look like that anymore. They literally don't. And it's such a different era too, Kelly, with, you know, from a political standpoint, from, you know, just a cultural conscious standpoint. I it, Some of the stuff in your book, I don't think it could be done anymore no, in general. No, absolutely you know? not. Yeah, absolutely not. When, when when you're taking pictures of a nude woman, you know, back then you could get away with saying a lot of stuff. Yeah. And all your yeah. stuff in, in your book and even the stories, you know, you were conscious of that. You, it's all very tastefully done. But um, you do reference other photographers doing stuff like that. But yeah, it's just different. So this is kind of something it, it adds another level of intrigue to the book is uh, yeah. almost the time capsule aspect of it. How much the world has changed as well. Uh, reading yeah. the book. Um, Absolutely. So, it is. It is very much a time capsule. Yeah. Yeah. And for these women all their lives, I know you talk about in a very, like I always looked at your book and there was a part of me that felt like this is kind of an unconventional love story to women. Uh, it is. You know, there's some people that would push back on that. I'm sure uh, there's, everybody's got an opinion nowadays, but you talk about women coming in and and really capturing this beauty with themselves for all times, something that they can look back on and have a time capsule for themselves. Yeah, that's that's why I really wanted to know them. I, I yeah. And over time, over doing it many years, I I I mean, my my mom raised me very well. I was never disrespectful to women, and and when I started doing this, you know, it was a whole different type of respect, but. Yeah, Overall, it just gave me a lot more respect for women. Mm -hmm. And I love women. What guy doesn't? And I learned <laughs> a real lot about them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to move on because we're, we're running out of a little bit of time. But I always ask the artist some standard questions here. So if you if you got like five more minutes, 10 more minutes, we'll, we'll do that. It. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I always ask a list of questions like biggest failures. Is there a failure that stands out in your mind that happened in, it could be in the musical career. It could be in your art career. It could be whatever. It could be in life and something that you did that you learned from. Oh yeah. I, that's an easy question for me to answer. <laughs> I mean, Shoot. you can read all about it. <laughs> um, <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's out there online all over the place, you know, that's true. Yeah. You know, and my only excuse is, hey, I was a real young kid. I grew up in bars, you know, yeah. um, nobody supervised me. You know, I just ran amok and, yeah. you know, finally committed a stunt that went beyond uh, acceptable to even be in a band anymore. So, yes, I would say that I definitely failed there. <laughs> so, yeah, we don't even need to go into it. People can Google it. Uh, and, and see what yeah. we're talking about. But and there's, if, a, you know, there's a lot of he said, it? she said about it. But, you know, I mean, I remember I was in a band, Kelly. I was the lead singer of a band, a punk band for many years. I got kicked out of the band. I did some crazy stuff, too. You know, when you're young and you're drinking and you're in a band, it's a different world. People don't understand it, you know. People don't understand it. Yeah. And, then you know, when you get to, you know, a level of success to where you're dealing with, you know, writers and, you know, people like that, that like to sensationalize things and yeah. make up things and pretty soon the ball gets rolling on a lot of misinformation yes so, for sure you know these days when somebody gets uh, you know accused of something you know uh it, it 
it gets snowballed into a much bigger thing. And then yes. now you're dealing with a, you know, a riled up public over it. Yeah. So, cancel culture. Yeah. It's, uh, it would be scary to do the kind of pictures I was doing now. Yeah. That, that was my big failure. The music business. I'm playing with one of the greatest guitar players who ever lived. Yeah. I screwed that up. And I figure the best thing to do uh, in order to live with myself is just to own up with, up to it. It's yeah. I, I talk about it in my book. Yep. Every single gory detail and yeah. own up to it. You know, if you do. And that's what wrong, I mean about your honesty. You know, that's what, that's what I think really resonates with you and your work is the honesty. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for I'm sharing your I'm, side. Of it. I'm even the first person to, to refer to move my uh, found object uh, pieces as uh, it's just a bunch of trash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. I mean, I go around the streets of Los Angeles. I find pieces in alleyways and stuff like that. You know, I'm up here in the Valley kind of close to your neck of the woods uh, up in Reseda now, but uh, oh, okay. I find, yeah, I find, I find stuff on the street and clean it up and turn it into paintings too and assembled pieces. I love it. I think, you know, it's just, it all has a story behind it and also, we're recycling materials, you know? You're not putting any more junk into the world that is being manufactured. So it's got yeah. that element to it as well. Not, nothing is really useless unless it smells horrible. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> unless you're going to bring it into your home and there's termites and it's going to you know, eat your whole house, then yeah. 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 Okay, so we'll move on to the next one. What about advice to young Kelly? This can be you at any age. You can be given advice to your 50-year-old self, your 20-year-old self, your 10-year-old self something that you've learned over the years that you'd like to impart on your younger self? Oh, I know what I teach myself. I I yeah. absolutely know because I have given so much thought to it. I love but it. Growing up, my dad always had us watch all these movies, you know, especially scary movies, Frankenstein's The Dracula, The Wolfman, The Abbott Costellos, you know. Yeah. And of course, you know, Laurel and Hardy and, and Jerry Lewis and on and on and on it goes, you know. So why didn't anybody look at this somewhat loquacious kid and say, maybe he should be in the movies? I mean, I lived in Burbank for crying out loud. <laughs> exactly. Like sitting down the street. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I really wish that I would have pursued something like that. So the advice I would give me is forget being a rock star, okay? Yes. Go for the actor guy. <laughs> I love it. I love a lot it. more longevity. Yeah. And, you know, if you keep your nose clean, you know, look at a guy like Canoe uh, Kano Rees. Yeah. You know, this guy's squeaky clean. You can't find no dirt on him. Yeah, that's true. You know, even even in the crowds well. he ran ar around with back in the day, you know, he was running around with some people that got into some trouble. But yeah, he's he's doing well. I just saw him up in the Hollywood Hills about a year ago. He was just kind of oh, really? hanging out on his on his bike. He's he's a big motorcycle guy, but he's yeah, just he kind of hanging solo. And uh, yeah, but I really I really admire what he does too. Yeah, I see. Uh, you know, I, I love films a lot, a real lot. I have a gigantic DVD collection. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I I watch child actors a lot because I, I just I think they're more interesting than some of the adult actors because I'm imagining being that age. And pulling off some of the stuff that they do. It's you crazy. Know, what gets said to them to make them do such a good job? That's what I always wonder. Yeah, I know. And then obviously there's the whole transition element. The ones that survive it and the ones who don't. I don't mean just the ones that actually do not survive life. But the ones who actually yeah. can transition to being a good adult actor as well. That's difficult. Yeah, you know, even yeah. in any kind of public eye is a dangerous place to be. Yeah, you know, things yep. can happen to you, and you know that's why you see, you know, especially rock stars, you know, dying tragic deaths. Yeah. You know, two of my favorite singers killed themselves, and you know, it's just uh, it, it, that lifestyle is tough. The films seem a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. You don't see a whole lot of actors killing themselves. Um, and some of it's kind of questionable, the ones that do mm -hmm. apparently someone like Robin Williams. Okay. Right. L look at this guy. Yeah. You know, and, and he hangs himself. Top of the world. Yeah. What, yeah. What, what, yeah. 
what happened to them? And it's just all that public stuff, I think, gets to them because it even gets to me and I'm not even that famous. But I, I can't even imagine being as famous as a guy like that. Yeah. You know, it probably would get to you someday if you have a certain sensitivity to, you know, yes. having that attention on you. I think um, it warps your brain, you know, it warps your perspective on life. It does. It does. Yeah. And I think that's happening nowadays with social media on a smaller level with everybody. Yeah. It's just warping people's perception of what reality is like and what you're supposed to be showing to the public and not showing to the public. It's just a crazy exactly. world. Yeah, I, I I, I, would not like being a kid these days. I'm glad I grew up when I did. Yeah, I got the tail end because I'm 44 right now. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I got like, I got out of there in college. I didn't have a cell phone in college. I came down here actually, Kelly, to be an actor going you know, taking years a step further. Right? Oh. Yeah, I came down here to act and paint. So I, I stuck with the painting, not the acting, but I loved acting. But I didn't get a cell phone until I came down here as an actor. So I was like 23. So I had a major portion of my life that it was before the, you know, the digital age and the smartphone age. And I'm really thankful for that. Yeah. See, I was like 40 when I got a cell phone. Yeah. Right. And it was like this big. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was probably a flip phone that big. So it made it even twice as big when you opened it. It was just a big, heavy thing. It was like 90% <laughs> battery and you know, 10% whatever else it does, you know, and it yeah. had a big antenna on it that, you know, didn't go down like that. So, you know, oh, you man. literally could hit somebody with one of those phones and kill them. Yes. And they didn't have the smartphone capabilities back then either. No, no. Yeah. So yeah. we're we're lucky in that sense, for sure. We are. We are. Yeah. Well, I'm going to end with one last one, and then I'll let you get on with your day. But it's been a lot of fun talking to you. I'm sure everybody is going to be intrigued to find out more about you, pick up the books, Angel with 30 Faces, the new one, Naked Vegas, and I'm projecting the, the third one out into the world. It's coming soon. Uh, about your found yeah, objects so. and minds. I think so. <laughs> I, I love to write. Yeah, I think it would be great. But the books that are out right now are Naked Vegas and uh, Angels with 30 Faces. But we're going to end with goals. It's a perfect way to end. What do you got coming down the pipeline or what? what's something that you want to work on? Um, I'd like to, I'd like to see my art do really well, of course. You know, it's, it's, I'm retired now and, and that's all I do. So that's yeah. my, my job. That's my business. So I want a successful business. So yeah. I want my art to do well. And, yeah. you know, I want to make my, my wife proud and, you know, I want, uh, you know, a good life. It doesn't sure. necessarily have to be financed by art, but I just want to see it really appreciated. That's my goal. I love it. That's a great goal. And uh, we'll be putting links in the show notes to people to check out the books and to check out your art. And um, is there anything that you want to leave us with? Anything you want to plug? Anything you feel like we left out? There's a lot of stories we left out, but I kind of, I wanted to gauge you because, you know, I think people should buy the book if they want to hear some of the other interesting stories but is there anything that you want to highlight or talk about that we left out uh you know i just i just want to know that that you know this naked vegas book was a book i wanted to write for a long time and when the pandemic hit that was the right time and i'm hoping people like it i hope they learn something from it you know particularly with the way i developed a business a 20-year business that was that was making you know uh, six figures a year, yeah. Um, you know, out of nothing, with a hundred dollar camera and a roll of film. Yes, and I was able to turn it into that. And so, if you, you know, if you have a dream, just go for it, man. Don't be afraid. You got to believe in yourself, and that's what I did. I had a lot of confidence. I said, I can do this. I can do this. And I just always kept my eyes looking for op open for opportunities, and and they saw, you yes. know, they saw them all over the place, and you just have to be smart. So, you know, that's that's what I would tell anybody, especially any artists who are maybe struggling or whatever. Just keep believing. Yes, that's great advice. And we'll finish with me saying that I love the adaptability in your career. I love the resilience, and I love the learning as you go not being afraid to just jump into it and learn as you go right. that's those are three major things that i see in your career that are, are really powerful and um i think anybody who picks up your books and looks into your life will will feel the same so thank you for sharing everything with us and um kelly garney thank you so much for coming on the podcast 
Thank you so much, Preston. I really had a great time talking to you. Awesome. Me too. We'll talk soon. All right. This has been the Living Artist Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I just want you to know that I appreciate you being here, and I'm grateful to be in your ears. Your art and creative life on this planet is meaningful, so thank you for sharing it with me. If you like this podcast, whatever platform you're listening to it on, please subscribe and share it with your friends. You can also leave me a positive review to show your support. This helps me to reach more people with the algorithmic magic and keep the show going strong. If you want to see more of what I do and check out the art that I create, you can visit my website at www.pmsartwork.com or follow me on social media everywhere at PMS Artwork. That's it for now. See you back here next time.